thank you very much everyone for coming and it's my great pleasure to introduce the speaker Konstantin Batidin. So uh, he received his um, bachelor's degree in astrophysics in 2008 in the UC Santa Cruz, and he received his uh, um, PhD at Caltech in 2012, um, and then we overlapped there, and also as well as in Santa Cruz. Um, and then uh, he spent some time in Nice, and also uh, Harvard as a postdoctoral fellow, and he's been uh, at Caltech since 2014 as an assistant professor. And also, uh, more important, uh, importantly, he received his uh, elementary school degree from uh, Japan, so he's very fluent in Japanese. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm very we are very happy that he's here for uh, the cherry blossoms, the perfect timing. Um, and also, he is uh, the recipient of a number of uh, awards, including uh, Packard Fellow, Packard Fellowship, um, and also. Uh, Popular Science Region 10, Forbes 30 Under 30, and NASA Fellowships, um, and also Harvard ITC uh, Prize Fellowship. So he's uh, a rock star um, in scientific science, but also he also in a rock band. So if you want to listen to his music, is it on Amazon? Oh, it's, it's available for sale on <laughs> iTunes, Spotify. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so uh, thank you for coming, and uh, uh, we are very excited to hear about uh, Planet Nine. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Mickey. It's my pleasure uh, to be here. Of course, you know, in, in part um, because you know I love I love visiting DC uh, to see my academic sibling, um, and it, it's it's true. I'm uh, you know I was on a Forbes list, but I was unfortunately on the wrong one. I was hoping to sort of end up on the rich list, but uh, they put me on the on the other one instead. Um, so, given given where we are uh, today, I want to uh, I want this talk to really to focus on on a single theme, and that theme is is how to make the solar system great again and uh, sort of restore it to its former nine planet glory that it has lost uh, over the last decade uh, or so. So. What's quite remarkable, right, is that if we if we go back through the history of planet discovery in the solar system, right, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty pathetic history, right? Like you know, in the since the adoption of the telescope by Galileo himself, we have discovered two bona fide planets, right? Two planets that weren't known already to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. Uh, and in fact, the first one um, was discovered by uh, Herschel right around the time of the Revolutionary War. Uh, Herschel was a very meticulous astronomer, so he kind of drew what he saw every night uh, precisely and noted that one particularly dim star was slowly moving across the night sky uh, and pointed out that this was indeed not just a background object and it was too bright uh, to be an asteroid. In fact. I didn't know this, but Herschel coined the term asteroid specifically to distinguish what he had found from tiny rocks uh, you know, between Mars and Jupiter. And uh, he had pointed out that this is the, you know, the first legitimate planet beyond Saturn, and he called it George, right, in honor of, of the king, because the king was pretty depressed at the time, uh, you know, having lost the war and everything. Um, and then the... I think the IAU didn't exist, right? But whatever the equivalent of the International Astronomical Union was at the time, uh, collectively said George is a terrible name for a planet, right? He should we should not have Jupiter, Saturn, and George. We should change it to something more legitimate. So they changed it to Uranus, um, right? And what what was immediately noticed is that is that this planet was not where it was supposed to be. Uh, and its orbit was immediately reconstructed, in fact, by going back to legacy observations. So it had been observed before many, many times, including by Galileo himself. So Galileo himself had, had drawings of Uranus in his notebook, um, but it was not recognized right, that it was moving. 
the Torbit was reconstructed first by uh, a guy named uh, Lexel, and subsequently in a more complete fashion by uh, Alexis Bovard, who compiled these tables in 1821, uh, demonstrating that indeed this planet was deviating from its predicted path. And you can tell that's what's going on, okay, from this from this page, okay? Because you have sines and cosines over here, so it's line of evidence one. And also you have a table with pluses and minuses, okay? So you've got both things that you need to know to understand that, that Uranus is not observed where it was supposed to be. And also, uh, it is to demonstrate that I'm on the right page, I know because there's Uranus here and, and, and there. Okay, so so what is what is happening, right? Why is Uranus not being observed where Newtonian gravity predicts it to be? Um, this part of, of the page, Bovard provides two explanations. Explanation number one, um, I mean, being sort of a good theorist, he said, well, we should probably not trust the observations. Right. Uh, so that after all, I mean, it's just like people looking at the night sky, drawing what they see. Like that can't be that precise. Um, but then he says, on the on sort of the off chance that the observations are right, uh, we cannot exclude the possibility that the solar system hosts yet another planet further out that is perturbing Uranus and causing it to go off course. So this this promise of this data set had to wait about 25 years before uh, Le, uh, this guy, uh, Le Verrier, who is typically credited with the mathematical discovery of Neptune, figured it out. So uh, as, a, as an undergrad at UC Santa Cruz, where Mickey and I overlap, I live in sort of a shady part of town, just kind of trying to save money on rent. So I can sort of spot a gangster when I, when I see one from far away. And it's just like, very is a gangster, all right? And you, you know it because he's got the bling, uh, you know, he's wearing the bling, his stage name is Urban, he's Urban Le Verrier. So I'm pretty sure it, like in reality he looks like this, but then the, whoever was making the, the portrait took away the, uh, all, the, all the key features. Okay, so this is a, this is a picture uh, from Verrier's manuscript where he, um, carried out a remarkable celestial mechanics calculation. He uh, carried out perturbation theories out to order eight and made no errors, right? So this is, this, people have gone through this calculation many, many times. And aside from sort of trivial typos, right? Indeed, this calculation contained no errors and demonstrated that indeed the Uranian orbit, the deviations of the Uranian orbit can be explained by the presence of yet another planet further out and not only did he demonstrate this as a kind of uh, possibility, he made a legitimate prediction of where this planet will be in the night sky. When he was done, he went to Paris to the Parisian Observatory, gave a talk to the observing crowd, um, which was quite warmly received. In fact, Perry, who was this sort of famous geophysicist of the time, said, cannot attempt to convey the impression which was made on me by the author's undoubting confidence, but the firmness with which he proclaimed to the observing astronomers, look into the place which I have indicated and you will see the planet well. So Leverier was clearly quite certain of the calculations he carried out. He was like, look, just go out there and find the planet. And intriguingly, he generated very, very little enthusiasm among the uh, observational crowd, you know, like, look, I mean, it's like cool math, bro, but like we gotta stay up, stay up at night for this, right? You know, it's like kind of make asking us to make a big commitment. Uh, so in the end, uh, it was a German astronomer named Gal who discovered Neptune. Um, as I understand it, uh, there was there was a program in place to search for Le Verrier's planet. And it was supposed to take, you know a long time, sort of a multi-year observational campaign. And on the first night, they went up to the telescope, uh, the sky went dark, they opened up the dome, found Neptune, one hour, right? It was just it was like the most epic, it was the most epic example uh, of the, I don't know, 
predictive power, I guess, of, of celestial mechanics, especially at this time, right, when it was, when physics was going from sort of being a descriptive uh, discipline to a predictive one. Um, it also is pretty interesting to note that the reason it worked out so well was because of timing. Okay? So the fact that it was 1846 was key to Leverrier being able to make his prediction as well as he did. Leverrier also had a contemporary uh, named Adams, and if you look, and Adams, as it turns out, was on the right track, but didn't quite get there in the same, uh, to the same level of uh, predictability and rigor as Leverrier did. So if you look up a picture of Adams on Wikipedia, he just looks like the most angry guy in the world. He just, you know. Um, so what they were able to get correctly was the location of Neptune in the night sky. Okay. Right? In fact, Leverrier's prediction had an error bar of about one degree. Okay. If you kind of are <coughs> honest about it. Right? What they got wrong was the orbit and the mass. Okay? So they had a Neptune that was too massive and had an orbit that was too long. In fact, you can almost see this just by looking at, at the picture, right? If this, uh, that this is the real Neptunian orbit and their, their uh, putative orbit is more eccentric right, than the real one. They had to add eccentricity to it to kind of make the orbital velocity turn out to be correct uh, at the point where it was observed. So the reason all of this worked out in 1846 was because Uranus and Neptune were very close to uh, conjunction. So you could more or less do this problem in a shearing sheet and get 85% kind of, of the way there, I think. Um, so you know, timing is key. If you were to redo it in 2011, and carry out the same assumptions, and importantly, both of them assumed that the tedious Bode law was correct, right? That the semi-major axes of the planets follow a geometrical succession. In 2011, exactly one Neptunian orbital period later, you would you would get totally the wrong answer. Of course, today we don't have to, you know, be in a Parisian apartment for five years and you know, carry out perturbation theory for to eighth order, you can just, you know, use n body integrators and Mathematica to kind of mimic the same calculation. So it's it's quite uh, it's quite remarkable. But it doesn't take away at all from from the validity and the epic nature of Leverrier's prediction and immediately upon the demonstration that indeed uh, you can predict the existence of planets beyond Neptune or beyond your known planets with uh, math, the number of other predictions just skyrocketed. In fact, if, uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list of, of planets that have been predicted beyond to reside beyond Neptune. Uh, the first one uh, was, was made in 1848, nearly two years after the discovery of Neptune itself. Uh, there's a character named George Forbes who predicted a planet at 300 AU, right? Didn't quite specify the mass, but said it would be, it would be big, um, right? And uh, in 1916, Parseval Lowell uh, sort of, well, he didn't do any calculations himself, I think, but he hired a bunch of people to compute uh, the orbits of Uranus and Neptune to try and resolve whatever remaining residuals existed in the observations with the existence of an additional planet. And when you kind of talk about planet X, that planet, that word, planet X, in fact, dates back to Lowell's, uh, Lowell's memoir that was published in 1916. And there have been many, many other predictions as well, including uh, some that are, that are much more modern, including uh, members of this very institute itself. So planet X, as originally formulated by Parseval Lowell was eventually discovered after Lowell had died. So Lowell died in 1916. Planet X was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh. Here is a picture, a real life picture of Clyde Tombaugh. You can also buy his biography in kind of children's book format, which is more fun to read than his real biography. 
Uh, and in, in 1930, right, this was a really big deal. Okay? So this is a picture of the New York Times from 1930. It's really interesting to read the rest of the paper, but the, the part that we'll zoom in on is here. It says, the sphere, possibly larger than Jupiter, and four billion miles away meets predictions. <laughs> right? So indeed, this, was, this discovery was interpreted as the true planet X that was perturbing uh, Uranus and Neptune. So because Neptune's mass was not measured very precisely until 1992, during the Voyager 2 flyby, there was still some room in the data for to kind of explain away Uranian motion with uh, additional perturbations. So that, that was the answer. Of course, today we know that this is not planet X. This is not the barge. Uh, this is Pluto, right? If we put Pluto on top of Russia, it'll fit, right? Uh, which is not like a huge criterion because a lot of things will fit if you put them on top of Russia. But uh, I mean, it's just, uh, right? It's also, I don't have this plot here, but it's fascinating to look at the mass of Pluto as a function of time, right? It just decreases almost linearly in log space, um, right? So uh, Pluto was. Uh, its mass was finally revised to what it is truly in, I think, 1978. Um, so my point, the reason I'm telling you about all of this is that at the turn of the century, right, there was just no evidence that the solar system contains truly anomalous things, right? There's no evidence in 1999 that there's a planet or, or anything massive that resides beyond Neptune. What astronomers did, however, find was, was a field of debris that is not massive at all, right? cumulatively maybe 0.1 Earth masses. Uh, but this field of debris, the Kuiper belt, is, is dynamically very interesting. And what we'll see in a second are all of the multi-opposition objects. So there's about 3,000 of these dots um, that are well known. They were well known as of 2014 or so. This tally has gone up a little bit, but it looks very similar. But the Kuiper belt, if you kind of draw all the orbits, which are shown here in orange, looks like a ring of stuff uh, beyond the orbit of Neptune. The detection and characterization of the Kuiper belt has been revolutionary in our understanding of how the solar system formed. Right? The story of how the planets evolved kind of had to be rewritten, more or less. Uh, because, in part, of the discovery of the Kuiper Belt. So, you know, there's, there's interesting things about it if you study the dynamics of the individual classes. But for the purposes of this talk, the only thing that, uh, that is relevant, and you can kind of see this um, if you just look at it, is that all of these orbits are gravitationally tethered to Neptune. Okay? They all come, more or less, to hug Neptune's orbit. Right, that's perihelion, right? That's they're all attached. Why gravity is conservative? So, uh, you know, if, if Neptune scatters you, you're going to eventually come back to where you started from, right? These orbits, I should point out, behave chaotically, right? They evolve in a chaotic fashion, but something that is a um, that is kind of a rule of thumb for the scattered disk population of the Kuiper Belt, which is the one we'll talk about further is that they're all physically attached to the orbit of Neptune, right? And this is because the entirety of the Kuiper belt was generated by scattering off of Neptune, right? Neptune emplaced these bodies into their current orbits. Um, so this rule of thumb was broken uh, first by in 2003, I guess, 2003, 2004, when, when my partner in crime on this work, Mike Brown, together with uh, Chad Trujillo and Vinny Rabinovich at Yale, uh, discovered this object, right, Sedna. So uh, you don't have to be like a mega expert in the Kuiper belt to know that something is different, right, about, about the orbit of Sedna compared to the rest of the Kuiper belt. First of all, at its, at its aphelion point, it goes out to 1,000 AU, and that's a staggeringly 
large distance, right? Um, if that's all it was, you could say, well, okay, I mean, this is just an object which is on its way maybe to leaving the solar system, meaning that it has repeated encounters with Neptune and its, orbit is, its, its orbital energy is just barely negative. So it's just barely bound, right? You could say that. But that's not the most remarkable thing about, about Sedna. It's the, it's the perihelion distance, right? The fact that at closest approach to the solar system, it doesn't hug the orbit of Neptune. As a consequence, right, it's or Sedna doesn't see, right, the gravitational, uh, the short periodic gravitational potential of Neptune. All it sees is the orbit average kind of quadrupolar field of the planet. So all that happens if you evolve the orbit of Sedna forwards or backwards, it'll just precess, right, with a period of about half a billion years, it'll kind of slowly rotate. Uh, what does this mean? This means that the orbit of Sedna could not have been simply emplaced into the Kuiper belt by interactions with Neptune. Some other thing is required to explain it, right? So I was aware of Sedna, cer certainly when I was a grad student. Uh, Mike was one of my two graduate advisors, and I was just like, yeah, this is, this is odd, and we all know it's odd. But when you have one object that kind of sticks out from the population, the tendency is to be like, uh, just something, something bad happened to Sedna, I don't know, just that's the explanation, something bad, right? We, we just don't know, but something's bad. But then, a decade later, Scott Shepard here and Chad Trujillo discovered a second Sedna-like object, right, which they called Joe Biden. So Joe Biden, was observed orbiting the solar system on this also very weird detached orbit. So at closest approach to the sun, right, it comes in to around 80 astronomical units. So this was like a definite declaration. I mean, this is like, this is no longer a joke, all right? Like Sedna, you could say something bad. But if you, the moment you have two data points, like you need a theory, okay? Like this is not, is no longer, there's no longer room to mess around. And this was really um, the motivation and the inspiration for, for Mike and I to look into this problem deeper because this was a, a brilliant, uh, brilliant discovery. What was actually more brilliant about their paper was not the discovery of, of Joe Biden, the object itself. It was, it was pointing out that something strange is happening in the, in the outer belt, right? So uh, Trujillo and Shepard right, made this plot, and this plot is, is, I think, the most striking thing about that paper, right? They pointed out that something called the argument of perihelion, which is the angle made between the line of nodes, so the point where you intersect the ecliptic plane as you go up, uh, and the perihelion point, right? So this, this angle has a a certain pattern beyond uh, 150 AU, right? And they pointed this out, and, and they indeed said, well, one of the explanations for this that could potentially maybe work is the Kozai effect uh, forced by a yet undetected super Earth that lives somewhere, somewhere there. So I found this to be genuinely striking. I found the Kozai effect explanation to be to be questionable because in order to maintain the argument of perihelion close to zero by the Kozai effect, you would need uh, to have the planet be close to the test particles that it's perturbing in terms of semi-major axis ratio, and this spans a large semi-major axis range, right? So, so I thought, well, it's probably not a planet, but, but this is there's something intriguing going on. And something we noted kind of by, by looking at this further is that it was more than just the clustering of the argument of perihelion. Right? If it's just the clustering of argument of perihelion, you make, uh, you know, if, you, if you look at it in physical space, you, have, you make a set of orbits that trace out this fan-like structure or like the inside of a jet engine. They would kind of look, look like this 
interesting flower uh, pattern. What we noted is that that's not actually what's happening. Instead, the distant orbits are physically aligned right, in, in physical space. So it's not the argument, it's the longitude of perihelion and the longitude of ascending nodes that, that are clustered together. And you can see the fact that right, all of these guys live roughly in the same plane. You can kind of almost put a piece of paper through the plane of, of these objects that are about 18 degrees inclined with respect to the ecliptic. And equally strikingly, they're all pointing at me, right? And I know I'm, you know, gravitationally attractive, but you know, this is, this is, this is pretty weird. Um, now, uh, living in California, right, like big data is, is kind of what you have to insert at the beginning of every sentence, right? Uh, and, and we're clearly not in that regime here. Right, there's like six ellipses, so like it's, it seems kind of a silly to be making a big deal out of uh, out of small data. Um, but the intriguing, the thing that makes this uh, this combination of six orbits relevant is the fact that your comparison sample is big. Okay? So all of them are discovered close to perihelion, where they are closest to the Earth and therefore brightest. Right, and over here they just live in terms of current radial distance among the rest of the Kuiper belt. So as a first order kind of estimation of what is the false alarm probability of this, you can just choose six Kuiper belt objects from a scattered disk at random, right? Say things beyond, with semi-major axes beyond 50 AU uh, in this dynamical class, how often would you get clustering as good as what we see here? And the answer is 0.007%. Well, so I'm, just like, I'm not a gambling man, so uh, I'm not, uh, I think that's some, something else other than chance that's going on. Uh, I should say that that number um, dates back to our 2016 paper. Uh, since then, there have been some work on trying to debias that number, and, and you get, it's actually, the, the statistic is, is worse. It's worse by a factor of two. So it's 0 0.14%. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the current estimate. Uh, so one way or another, the false alarm probability is indeed quite low. So to quote my favorite documentary of all time, uh, strange things are afoot beyond about 250 AU in the solar system. Um, the issue with, with this realization, right, which uh, I think uh, was both striking in the, in the Trujillo and Shepard paper and then realization that there's this additional clustering of the, of the planes in the direction, right, is that um, it's, it's actually difficult to then explain it, right? Um, so my, my first intuition looking at this is like, well, Probably what's going on is that this is the collective effect, the collective gravitational effect of, uh, of the distant Kuiper belt. Maybe there's enough mass out here that it overcomes the differential precession, right, that arises from the, from the uh, planets, and you can kind of self-modulate the orbit. Turns out uh, you would need about 10 Earth masses of of Kuiper Belt objects out here to make that happen. And uh, we never published anything about this, but Anne-Marie Megan, uh, who is now at University of Colorado um, in Boulder, has a pretty nice paper about that effect. So there's A, there's not enough objects out there that's just like incompatible with uh, observations. B, by that, uh, by that model, you can only explain the clustering in the argument that Chad and Scott saw, you can't explain the physical clustering of the orbit. So something different is required. Um, you might then invoke a, a stellar flyby, for example. Say, okay, well, you know, maybe a star came by and you know created some pattern, and we still see the relic of that pattern. Now, turns out that doesn't work either because all of these semi-major axes are quite different from one another. 
And the differential precession that arises from the planet, right? Because to these objects, the planets just look like rings of mass because they go around really fast. And, they, and a ring of mass will cause you to precess uh, at a rate which is proportional to some relatively large power of your semi-majorizer. So all of the, this pattern would disperse on geologically short time if left alone. So something must be holding this set of orbits together now. So uh, when I was in eighth grade, uh, my, my algebra one teacher told me that if you don't, ha don't know the answer, right, you can still guess and check. Right? So, so that's the approach that, uh, that was taken initially to this problem. So like, okay, well, let's guess and then later check if we, I don't know, like put a massive object into this cluster, maybe it'll hold the orbits together, I don't know. Um, and the, the advantage of kind of that configuration is that you can do it on the board uh, to, to some level of approximation. So I wanna spend the next 48 minutes uh, discussing this. Uh, and by the way, I gave this talk uh, once at, at like the UST math department and he said, oh, please no, don't go on to the next slide. This is the <laughs> best slide, right? Uh, so realistically, what you can do is you can, you can write down an integrable Hamiltonian that is, consists of sort of three parts. It consists of this term, which is um, governing the differential precession that I just talked about. This term, the second term is not very important. It kind of just uh, accounts for the fact that you uh, have a coordinate system that co-processes with the putative planet, the massive object you introduce. And then this, this third term is a kind of leading order approximation to the secular coupling between them. And all that this is good for is kind of order of magnitude estimates, but what it does tell you is that if indeed there's a planet causing this, right, it's gotta have a pretty eccentric orbit, right? So it needs an eccentricity of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 at least. And it's got to have uh, a mass that substantially exceeds one Earth mass. Okay. Now, despite, despite what you see in the news on a daily basis, we no longer live in 1846. Um, and, and we have computers now. And we have <laughs> computers and we have an n-body integrator, which was written by another illustrious member of, of this institution. right? So, so you can take advantage of of that and do numerical experiments. So the, the set of numerical experiments we uh, carried out is actually quite simple, I would say. It, you take the solar system, you take the solar system and you um, kind of envision its primordial form. Um, this is not the end of the experiment, just FYI. feeling that this is going to be, okay. Uh, you, you basically, this is a technical issue. We've, we always have these when we perform with the band, right? Where, where somebody's amp turns off or the drums blow up or something. Uh, I've, I rarely see this, but okay. I will, um, I'll just tell you in words what happens, right? So you, uh, you start out the solar system in its state um, as it were, uh, four and a half billion years ago when the Kuiper belt just formed. So you put, submerge it into this axisymmetric disk of eccentric planetesimals. So the Kuiper belt had just been in place by Neptune. And you also subject it to the gravitational potential of a planet with some parameters. And you choose these parameters many times and you, you run the experiment many times. What uh, we would see if, if this ran a little longer is we would, aha, perfect, problem solved. Okay, if only, if only the band problem, I could just click play. Okay. So what we'll see in a little bit uh, is that the way that this evolved, uh, first of all, many of these objects disappear. Right? They disappear because they, be, they get scattered out of the solar system or in, right? So the ones that, um, that get um, the 
acquire perihelion distances smaller than the orbit of Neptune, who we just forget about. We say, okay, they uh, become centaurs and then eventually get scattered in and in until they become Jupiter family comets, right? Um, so in blue are the guys with long orbital periods, the, the population that we're interested in, the gold orbits represent uh, more or less the conventional part of the Kuiper belt. And you can see this differential procession in, in beautiful detail, right, among the gold orbits. They're all being mixed up. But something different is happening to the blue orbits, the long period guys. So the long period guys are slowly being sculpted into a, a well-defined pattern. Right now we're about two and a half billion years into the solar system's lifetime, and a pattern begins to emerge where all of these uh, surviving, long-term surviving particles have orbits that point the other way, right? They, they're upsidally anti-aligned with respect to the orbit of, of planet nine. And you can do this calculation many, many times, and uh, in the end, at the end of the day, you can just sort of say, at what planetary parameters do you fit the uh, dispersion of the uh, observed orbit best? And it turns out, so at the time, the orbit we derived was about 700 AU in semi-major axis and an eccentricity of about 0 0.6. I'm uh, writing a review article on Planet Nine at the moment uh, where I'm kind of redoing a lot, of, a lot of this work better. And I think that the eccentricity is actually slightly lower. It's closer to 0.45. And the semi-major axis is probably about, um, about right. Um, so, so this type of, of perturber can explain the physical clustering of the orbits we see, the fact that they're all confined. And it can also simultaneously give a explanation for why Sedna and Joe Biden have orbits that are detached. Right? We started that calculation with all of the orbits that's attached to Neptune. But due to the perturbations, the, the secular perturbations from uh, planet nine, what happens is you induce this cycle in, uh, in eccentricity and longitude of perihelion. So as the orbits rattle around within this cluster, their orbits periodically detach and attach from Neptune. So, so that's, that's what's going on. Right? So as I've mentioned before, the existence of a trans-Neptunian planet is, is, has been proposed, I don't know, a hundred times, maybe more, over the last uh, century and a half. Right? So there's absolutely zero novelty in, in coming here and saying there might be a planet beyond, beyond Neptune. It's just like, yeah, so, some guy named Jacques Babinet that in 1848, right? So the only, the only thing <laughs> that, that differentiates every one of these proposals of the existence of planets is A, the data that you're trying to explain, right? We're certainly not trying to explain Uranian motion. Right? We're trying to explain clustering with the Kuiper belt. And equally as importantly, it's the dynamical mechanism through which you explain the data. Intriguingly, Despite the fact that celestial mechanics has this long tradition that spans centuries, perturbation theory is not very well developed for orbits that, are, that have eccentricities of 0.5 and that overlap. Okay, why? Because perturbation theory was de developed to understand the solar system. So typically, the way you approach that problem is you take the governing Hamiltonian, you expand it in series of small eccentricities and small inclinations. That's not the problem at hand. So in order to characterize the dynamical mechanism, we have to do a little bit of work. So sort of a toy model that you can imagine for planet nine to Kuiper belt object coupling, you can first replace the canonical giant planets that we know of with just a quadrupole moment of the sun. Right? You can say they, their orbital periods are really short. They go around the sun really fast. And the, on long periods of time, they look like rings of mass, and we can just absorb that into a oblateness of the sun. So that turns it into a sort of a restricted, elliptic, highly elliptic three-body problem. Yeah. So what, if you do this problem in the plane, what you will find out is that the objects that remain, 
stable are the ones that have been captured into mean motion resonance, okay, which just means that they have this uh, integer relationship between the orbital period of planet nine and, and the KBOs, right, just by, by chance. Right? They've initially been scattered out by Neptune and happened to land into an island, this, this island of stability. Because there were 20 Earth masses of material scattered initially, what we see now is just that tiny fraction of objects that, that happened um, to survive. And you can sort of study the, the topology of the resonance in an in a interesting semi-analytic way and compare it with the simulations and understand what's going on. But the key insight that you get out of this is that the, this cycle between the orbital eccentricity and the longitude of perihelion, the, the major axis oscillation, if you will, is an effect which is fundamentally secular, right? So the reason the orbits do this is because they see planet nine not as a point mass, so to speak, but they, they feel the orbit average gravitational potential uh, of the object. So you can um, more or less imagine the effect of, of planet nine for the purposes of understanding the alignment as arising from a massive wire that has the uh, shape of its orbit. And so uh, I've, I've revisited this problem with, with my, my friend Alessandro Morbidelli in 2017. So, so the math is a little bit different, okay, as you I'm sure can tell. Some of this is irrelevant, like this is something my, my student drew. Um, but point is, uh, if you're interested in the kind of celestial mechanics of this problem, uh, there, there is kind of an updated understanding uh, which was published last year. What I tell my, my graduate students, uh, which is the same thing that our advisor told us, is that if you have a theory that just explains the observations uh, that you wanted to explain, you can get a B plus. Okay? It's, it's like, it's good. All right? It's just not, it's not very good. Okay? And the reason at this stage the Planet Nine model, as, as formulated, falls short of, of an A minus, okay, is because we haven't actually predicted anything that we can then go and test and refute the model, okay? Right, so if you just explain stuff, it's like, yeah, you haven't actually learned anything new. You, you, gotta, you gotta make a prediction. Uh, so that was, I don't know, back in, when I was writing the first Planet Nine paper, it was a little bit, disconcerting that we didn't have uh, a good way to, to point out a good population that Planet Nine creates that uh, you could then go and see or point out or demonstrate that it's not there. But yes, yes. So I, I like, uh, you know, I like sort of the Karl Popper way of thinking more where you, sh you should have something that refutes your model rather than confirms it. Karl Popper is calling it bad confirmation. I 100% agree. That would be a fantastic confirmation of the model. But then suppose you search the night sky down to magnitude 23 and you don't find it, right? And then does that mean that it doesn't exist? No, it, right? It means, it means maybe it's high, maybe it doesn't exist. It's like searching for uh, you know, the um, MH370. Right, you kind of know where to look. The the airplane is it with the Malaysian? Oh, yeah, the, the, sorry. yeah. <laughs> Come on, didn't you miss every minute of coverage on CNN like two years ago? Um, right. So so it's better to have something that that refutes your model, in in my view. And like right before we were ready to submit, we noticed something something interesting to this end. We noticed that every successful simulation that we uh, that we ran, right, the ones that reproduced this clustering, also did create a, a, a weird uh, orbital pattern. And we weren't, at the time, looking at things that uh, occur at high inclination because most, um, most surveys of the distant solar system are fixed to the ecliptic plane, more or less. So it's not very interesting 
to, to study what you make where you don't observe things. But if you do lift that, uh, that uh, restriction, you find that, in fact, it's so you, this is a plot of inclination versus the longitude of, uh, of perihelion offset. So the bodies we were talking about, they kind of live in these, these clusters here, right, at low inclination at 180 degrees. But if you track what happens to some of them at high inclination, occasionally these guys will go up and then this very defined pattern come back down. Right? We initially interpreted this to be related to the Kozai lead of mechanism. Uh, turns out it's, it's not. So in that updated paper with, with Morbius, we've understood this better. It's a different high order secular resonance. But the key thing about it is that low inclination objects will go up, become visible right about here, at almost 90 degree inclination, so in a perpendicular state to the solar system, then become invisible again, then come back down. So there should be, if you were to conduct an off ecliptic survey, right, you should be able to discover some of these guys. So I was quite excited about this and went down the hall to, to Mike Brown's office and said, I think we, we have a pretty intriguing observational prediction because we kind of predict these guys. And he said, you know, I think Dr. 30 is an object that does this. So, so Mike, what Mike had remembered was that there was an object detected in, I guess, 2014, and nobody made a big deal about it, but it was indeed uh, detected with an orbital inclination that was like really, really staggeringly high. Um, and in fact, it was detected not by a Kuiper Belt survey, it was detected by accident in a near-Earth asteroid survey, right, which doesn't discriminate on the ecliptic plane, right? So you're going to have a pretty embarrassing time explaining to the White House, you know, why the killer asteroid came from all of off ecliptic and we only looked in the ecliptic, you know. So, uh, so long story short, uh, we, we looked at that data in more detail and found that there have actually been five of these objects detected already. They're kind of the freaks of this population. They're the high, high, high eccentricity end of this of this population and they have perihelion distances that live in interplanetary space but they're more or less where they're supposed to be and so this is kind of to me maybe the most convincing uh, line of evidence for the existence of planet 9 the fact that in addition to this pattern of uh, of distant orbits the model also predicts populations guys that live perpendicular to the plane of the solar system and they're about 75 degrees off to the side on each side. Okay. So it's, it'll be very interesting, right, as the kind of observational uh, census of distant KBOs continues to, to map this population out better because I think it holds an intriguing key. Um, there's something else that, that is striking. So uh, about, I don't know, a year after uh, all this work was done, uh, this object was detected named Niku, or Niku, which means meat in Japanese. It's a strange, strange nickname for a, for a KBO. Um, so, but, but Niku was, was evidently a big puzzle, okay? Because it's, you can see the puzzling. So it says, what's up with Niku, okay? Object weird orbit puzzle scientists, okay? And indeed, its, its orbit is, is quite puzzling because it too is orbiting the solar system on its side, but it's not presently being affected by planet nine. Its semi-major axis is 37 AU or something like that. Very, very close to where Neptune is today. At present, it's completely dominated by interactions with Neptune to a lesser extent the other planets. So this is not part of the Planet Nine story, but it too has this orthogonal orbit. So, you know, indeed, like the, evidently like other scientists, we were puzzled um, and sort of thought, okay, wh what's going on here? Well, remember that a few slides back, I said we threw away 
every object that left every object that left the solar system, that's fine. But we also threw away objects whose perihelion distances penetrated this interplanetary space. And it turns out it's a good idea at times to go back and revisit the objects that you threw away from your simulations. Right? And here's what we found. So what we found is that this cycle that I just described, the like low eccentricity to high, in, uh, sorry, low inclination to, to high inclination cycle, um, will indeed throw some of these objects into this inner solar system. Right? So this would be planet nine, Uranus, Neptune, a random Kuiper belt object undergoing chaotic evolution. And every time it hugs the orbit of Neptune, it gets scattered. Some things can get scattered out, others can get scattered in. Right? And this particular simulated body, right, it gets scattered in and, and it's just like, if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it, okay? I mean, it's, at the end of the simulation, what's striking is that this particular body reproduces the orbit of, of Niku, okay, to like staggering precision, right? I mean, it's just, within like five degrees inclination, or maybe within 0 0.01 in eccentricity and so on. So, so that's, I think, what's b going on. It's the fact that the more proximate part, we've been talking about the distant Kuiper belt for so long that we forgot to talk about the more proximate conventional part of the Kuiper belt. This region is also being polluted by planet nine, by objects that undergo planet nine forced evolution out here on this plot and then get scattered in by Neptune. And in fact, this Niku object should not have been a big deal at all because it turns out there's a bunch of them at really high inclination. Okay, and the first one that was detected in a, almost the same orbit was detected back in 2008 and uh, its name is, is Drac, which is probably meat in some other language, I don't know. Um, Right, so these guys, these really high orbital inclinations, you cannot just reproduce from solar system formation. But if you include planet nine, it turns out that you pollute the Kuiper belt in all of this region. So I think that these guys are actually objects that have come from further out and have suffered also planet nine forced evolution. Okay, I'm running out of time, but I'll say one more thing, okay? And uh, so when, when I was in, kid in elementary school in Japan, I was told by our uh, sensei, do not look at the sun. Okay, it's like very explicit. And I remember, do not look at the sun. Uh, but Sir Carrington in 1859 did not get that advice, okay, and was the first person to measure the rotation of the sun and pointed out that the sun is not rotating in the same plane as the rest of the solar system. In fact, they're six degrees off. This is well known. Okay? So motivated by, by that notion, we thought if planet nine lives in some other orbital plane compared to the, the plane of the, the planet, its long period torque, right, its, its secular, its orbit average torque will cause the inner orbits to process. Okay? Just like the inner orbits are causing planet nine's orbit to process. So the plane of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and the rest of the solar system, what we call the invariable plane, if there exists a planet nine, is actually a variable plane, okay? And this variable plane will slowly shift. Now, if it shifts by 35 degrees, okay, then we're just wrong, okay? Because then the sun's obliquity will be 35 degrees. If it shifts by 0 0.001 degrees, then it, mean, it doesn't mean anything. But as it turns out, if you just plug in the same parameters that you kind of derive from the Kuiper belt, you can, uh, and reverse time, you can restore the plane of, of the planets to almost exact coplanarity with the sun. Okay? So just by, just by reversing time. So you can, in, in some sense, derive the solar obliquity and the longitude of the solar spin axis from the distant Kuiper belt and, and vice versa through uh, planet nine's gravitational interactions. Okay, I'm, I'm definitely running out of time. I'll just say that we, uh, along with uh, many other groups, 
particularly Chad and Scott are, are I think, leading the effort uh, on this, are looking for Planet Nine, for more Kuiper Belt objects using uh, this telescope. I have had, this is my sort of first foray, the last couple of years have been my first foray into observational astronomy. I'm just a simple theorist by day, okay? But by night, I, I sit at the telescope and do nothing while it automatically shifts from <laughs> field to field. Uh, so, so what I've learned is, is that it's, it's staggeringly massive, right? I mean, like the Subaru telescope looks like it came out of like a Mecha Godzilla movie and just, you know, materialized into the real world. Okay, I think at this point I'll, I'll finish and take any questions that might arise. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that question of what magnitude is Planet Nine, so, so the answer is we don't know for sure, probably 24, okay? If you assume that Planet Nine is, is, has a Neptune-like albedo, right, a radius similar to, to that of Neptune, then you get of order 24, okay? But there's quite a bit of range there. That's an excellent question. So uh, when it comes to the population of objects beyond 250 AU, all long-term stable things should be aligned. But, well, no, I'm sorry. That is, that is strikingly not true. 78% of, of all distant things should be aligned. There is one caveat to this statement and that is that we don't model the pollution of the distant belt by things that are being scattered out from interior, right? So that, that pollution is actually something I'm looking into at the moment, and I don't have an answer for you yet. This, the relative r ratio of the high inclination guys depends very sensitively on Planet Nine's eccentricity. And we don't have a good constraint on the observational senses of those, those objects at high uh, semi-major axis, but we do have a pretty good handle on Jupiter family comets, right? And David Misvorny has, has written a very nice paper showing that if Planet Nine is too massive, right? He adopted a Planet Nine, which is considerably more massive than what we usually do. Uh, you overpopulate the high inclination tail of, of the JSC. So I think that there's a constraint in the Jupiter family comet population that tells you something about Planet Nine's inclination. So that's that's another. I'm I'm not actively solving that problem, but it's definitely on the list. Well, uh, so so first, uh, so first um, there was the Big Bang, and the Planet Nine formed and then the solar system formed around. I mean like that's that's pretty much as as convincing of an explanation. I actually this is this bothers me a lot. There is not a great story that you can tell uh, if you're honest on how the Nice model can do it very, with a very low probability. Okay? So even before all this planet 9 stuff, right? Uh, David Misvorny and and Mike and I wrote papers about how the solar system may have formed additional cores that would have gotten ejected during the Nice model. In fact, it kind of helps to sacrifice one to Jupiter and Saturn to trigger the instability. But when you eject it, right, first of all, it suffers from the same problem where its perihelion is attached now to the ejector, namely Jupiter or Saturn. So you need some other thing to perturb it out. Okay, you invoke the fact that the young solar system is 
in a cluster. You would go passing stars to lift the perihelion. Great. Now you're in trouble because the same passing stars then have a pretty large probability of stripping Planet Nine off. Right? If you have interactions that lift the perihelion, you can also just add energy and, and, and make it gone. So then you need many, many ejections uh, of Planet Nine things, or you need uh, like things, or you need to get lucky. So that's kind of an uncomfortable story. There's there's been another uh, another intriguing paper uh, I think last year which pointed out that if there existed a a massive ish disk of planetesimals that went beyond the Kuiper belt, you can use dynamical friction to circularize Planet Nine. I think there's no evidence for the existence of such a cryo disk at at a hundred AU. Uh, but that actually gives you a much better story for forming Planet Nine. But I, um, you know, I still prefer. Actually, I don't prefer prefer anything. I'm completely confused, right? I don't think it's a dark matter black hole, uh, despite the numerous mails I get from from crazy <laughs> people on the daily basis. Uh, but but for all we know, it, it could just be. You know. Yeah. When, do, when can we observe Planet Nine? Uh, after I get tenure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, it's it's a great question, and um, you know the original kind of our original hope was that it was going to take three, maybe four years, right? Uh, this year we had three runs uh, on on Subaru, and the first one was was great, um, and. Um, the two other ones were horrible, right? And so, so uh, this is something that I, again I, I've learned. Like being being a theorist, the bad weather is great. You know, I don't want to go to the beach. I'll just stay at, at home and work, right? It's like if you're an observer, bad weather means you don't get data. Turns out, uh, so so the short, I guess the the answer is that if we don't observe it on a time scale of um, say five years, right? Then there's a couple. Uh, ways forward. Number one is then to try and do difference imaging in the galactic plane, which is a huge pain. Um, and actually, I should start calling it the galactic pain rather than the galactic plane. Um, and the the other uh, kind of interesting development is that LSST is going to go online. And LSST will, if it doesn't find Planet Nine, which it very well might, it will at least find like 200 of these distant KBOs. So if you lift yourself out of the small data regime, and now you have actual good statistics to work with, then you, then I can make much better predictions on exactly where to look. So I think uh, if we don't find it on sort of a half a decadal time scale, there's still a way forward, but it would make me pretty uncomfortable. That's a great question. So no, there is there's literally no information in the data on the longitude of Planet Nine, and that's because we have we all we have in the data are the orbits of the distant KBOs, right? If I had arcs, right? If I mean I do plan to live on as a cyborg forever, so and, and the orbital periods are are ten thousand years, so that that's kind of what what the time scale over which you have to observe. These KBOs. If you had arcs, then then great. You could derive the longitude of Planet Nine in the same way that you derive the Viridid. The one kind of tangential way to try and do this is to use Cassini data, okay, and this has been done uh, by a French group led by Agnès Sienga, and they demonstrated that if you just take the Cassini data, right, Cassini telemetry data and put Planet Nine at, I think, a true anomaly of 112 degrees, as opposed to some other true anomaly, you explain, you reduce the residuals of the Cassini telemetry data down to something like zero, right? So you actually have a better explanation for the spacecraft orbit. But the group at JPL, led by uh, William Faulkner and company, say that that's, that's not true, 
Uh, and the reason they say that's not true is because in the Sienga paper, um, they computed the light, so the light equation uh, for distance between the Earth and, and the spacecraft assumed that the space-time geometry is the same going back and forward, but actually is different by eight hours because planets move. It's astonishing to me that that matters, okay? But turns out that that, that little detail uh, basically smooths out the curve. So there's no, as far as we can see, there's no signal in the Cassini data on where planet nine is, only a constraint on how close it can be to mess up the, the, uh, the, the data. So, so, uh, so I think we, unfortunately, will not know what the longitude is. We only know the orbit. Mm. Yeah, the constraint on the long, on the angular momentum of, you mean the the tilt of the plane? No, because that that tilt happens over four billion years. So the yeah, the the tilting it comes from entirely from an average effect. Yeah, so it's it's frustrating, right? It's frustrating because I truly believe that planet nine is there. I think that the evidence is actually pointing towards it rather than against it, and observation, additional observations, uh, what, what Scott and Chad have collected uh, are, are actually in line with all of these patterns, uh, but it's frustrating to not be able to derive a specific point on the night sky. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks again. Thank you. Uh, this is good, good entertainment. There was a recent paper that apparently some star claimed close by and uh, Created some. Yeah, but that, that's actually that. Uh, I think it was a seventy thousand year year, so it's, <laughs> I mean, it was it's a little bit further out. Right. Yeah. yeah. Than, than what we would be looking at. I see. <laughs> And that now it's really coming to life. So now this the page you're following is really fun. Uh, people actually live, you know. Oh yeah. So maybe I'm not. I, mean, I talked to Heidi briefly about that. So I'm not sure exactly when you guys are there, but it didn't work out last time. Uh, do you know when you're going? Uh,